Market to Market is everywhere you are. Subscribe to Market to Market on YouTube, find us on the PBS video app to stream on demand, and add our three podcasts on your favorite podcasting app. Coming up on Market to Market, pushback over Prop 12, again. Cutting waste to reduce greenhouse gases. Netting big returns in fishing leads to the world food price. The bowls there. If you want to and market you analysis with Elaine Cobb, next. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, December 24, 2021 edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. MFP payments to farmers for the three-year-old trade war with China have come under scrutiny, according to a Government Accountability Office report released this week. The county-by-county -county methodology for computing the amount of damage was referred to as flawed and made for inconsistent compensation. The report revealed payments to corn producers were higher in the South and lower in the West, the GAO, also estimated that payments to corn producers were approximately $3 billion higher than USDA's estimate of the trade damage. Dr. Seth Meyer, USDA's chief economist, says the USDA's Office of Inspector General found their model and methodology to be reasonable. In 2008, the rule for mandatory country of origin labeling, or COOL, went into effect. Several lawsuits and a repeal by Congress later the burden on producers and providers was removed. The same kind of legal dance is taking place in a state that is number one in U.S. agricultural production and boasts the fifth largest economy in the world. Peter Tubbs has more. Proposition 12, the California Voter Initiative approved in 2018, has been challenged in court on the basis that the details are not ready. A coalition of California retailers and restaurateurs have filed suit in state court to block the January 1, 2022 implementation of the law, which requires animals used in egg, pork, and veal production that are sold in the state be raised under specific space requirements. The measure was approved by voters in November 2018 by a two-to-one margin. Representatives from the pork and egg industry have sought to block implementation of the law in multiple legal suits, each case was based on the premise that if one state's animal production requirements were higher than current industry standards, it would violate the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. The court has ruled against each of these lawsuits. The new suit challenges the implementation of the law on the grounds that details of the new policy are two years late in being defined by the California Department of Food and Agriculture. The final comment period for the revised proposed rule ended December 17th. The terms of the lawsuit request a 28-month delay in activating the new rules to allow the pork, egg, and veal suppliers time to adjust their supply chains to the new policies. The North American Meat Institute, a trade association representing the bulk of the country's beef, pork, and veal processors and their suppliers, supports the delay. Until CDFA publishes the final rules, no one can adequately prepare to comply with the law with criminal sanctions, and that authorizes civil litigation. For Market to Market, I'm Peter Tubbs. A year and a half ago, Vermont residents were no longer allowed to send food waste to the landfill. The idea was to reduce human impact on the environment, including the amount of methane emitted by landfills. The Golden State will join their number but the difference is that the scale of implementation is 60 times greater than the Green Mountain State. Josh Bittner has more. 
bones and all the fixings left over from holiday feasts will ring out the new year differently across California as state-mandated food waste recycling takes effect. According to state officials, the 75% reduction target has never been attempted at this scale. The goal is to actually reduce methane emissions and other short-lived climate pollutants. Uh, now, methane is released when we put organic waste into landfills. A lot of the organic waste that we put in landfills is actually food waste. Researchers at the state and federal level say 40% of food is wasted in the U.S., with 15% of the nation's methane emissions tied to rot from landfills. And this material gets marketed for um, agricultural use, and we also have programs for our residents to come out here and get compost. Environmental lobbyists counter only 35 of the Golden State's roughly 200 composting locations can handle the expected surge. We just don't uh, bury and forget about it. We're actually taking responsibility and not leaving it for a next generation to do something. Some facilities use anaerobic digestion to turn compost into energy. Cities will be required to buy natural gas made from the product, which supporters hail as climate friendly and economically sensible. It's really easy. I mean, all you're changing is where you're throwing things. It's just another bin. Trash collection fees are expected to increase as local governments invest in new compost operations. I appreciate that we can be making a change without really impacting our lives very much. Though cities like San Francisco already require food waste recycling, many others, including Los Angeles, San Diego, and Sacramento, won't have their programs up and running on time. State reclamation agency Cal Recycle predicts one year of food recycling by 2030 will prevent 14 million metric tons of carbon emissions, equal to taking 3 million vehicles off the road for a year. I think this is a good way we can really just tell the story of food and the fact that we really need to do what's called closing the loop. The food comes from the land and we really should be returning that back to the land. For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. The easy intro for this story would be to say this year's World Food Prize laureate didn't just give someone a fish, but taught those in developing countries to fish. But there's more to the story than that. This year's winner changed diets for millions, opened a way of life to women that was once reserved only for men, and opened the door for them to contribute to the economy. This profile is our cover story. Born in Trinidad in 1949, Shakuntala Haraksing Tilstead found her first role models in the kitchen as four generations lived together. Her grandmother did more than cook meals for the family. She instilled the appreciation for good food and its vital role for good health. Later, the idea of fish for nutrition was introduced as a regular part of the nation's diet and would resonate for Tilstead. I am especially grateful for the values and principles that my mother and my grandmother instilled in me while I was growing up in Trinidad and Tobago. These values and principles to make the best of one's ability, to strive and to excel, and at the same time to help others have guided my life and my career. For these precious gifts, I am ever grateful. Following her completion of undergraduate studies, Tilstead worked as an agricultural officer in Tobago. She was the one and only woman working in the ministry on the island. She earned her doctorate at the Royal Veterinary and Agricultural University in Denmark, later becoming a professor at her alma mater in what now is known as the University of Copenhagen. The classroom was not confined to a campus-only location, as Tilstead started projects all over the developing world to improve nutrition for women and young children. During the late 1980s, while working in Bangladesh, she discovered undernourished children being brought in for medical attention, but there was little to be done to save their lives. A colleague suggested the best way to help was to make sure that the children were eating fish. Tilstead eventually would recognize the role small fish could play in providing important sources of essential nutrients and fatty acids 
opening up the nutritional options for many of those who are malnourished. Together with researchers at Bangladesh Agricultural University, Tilstead helped develop pond polyculture systems, the farming of small and large fish together. This led to discoveries of increasing productivity fivefold. Helping increase the size of the catch was the introduction of a small gill net designed for women to harvest mola in small amounts and for daily household use. The high nutrient value of the fish led to others understanding the merits of pond polyculture. Policy changes in nutrient reduction led to greater harvests and expansion of fish-based foods. Tilstead expanded efforts into creating ready-to-eat fish-based foods targeting mothers and their young children. This included a chutney and fish powder that was four times the nutrient density of fresh fish. Tilstead's work led to women as entrepreneurs producing value-added foods and contributing to the overall economy. Tilstead is now the global lead for nutrition and public health at the nonprofit research organization World Fish, helping guide other research institutions, government agencies, and funders collaborate to meet UN sustainable development goals. Since the announcement of the 2021 World Food Prize in May, I have been thrilled to see this recognition has greatly magnified global attention to aquatic foods as a powerful game changer towards healthier and sustainable diets that work for all people and our planet. Her work in the sustainable production of fish across several countries likely improved the diets of millions for the most vulnerable in Asia and Africa. This recognition of my work opens up new opportunities to amplify support and investments for research and innovation in the aquatic food systems and thus expand our thinking on solutions that benefit people, nature, and the economy. I will continue to call upon researchers and students, especially young women from low and middle income countries, to build on my work and take it forward to new heights. Looking ahead to the future, a sustainable food systems transformation will not be possible without due attention and investment given to aquatic foods alongside crops and livestock. Next, the Market to Market Report. We are producing the show on Wednesday, and we have a better understanding of the severity of last week's storm in the Southern Plains and how it has impacted the holiday shortened trade week. For the week, the nearby wheat contract added 39 cents, while March corn improved 9 cents. The continued dry pattern in South America and a technical chart move impacted the soy complex. The January soybean contract increased 44 cents. January meal strengthened 23.30 per ton. March cotton expanded by $1.53 per hundredweight. Over in the dairy parlor, January class three milk futures went up 18 cents. A green week in the livestock sector as February cattle gained 95 cents. January feeders improved by $1.53 and the February lean hog contract added 255. In the currency markets, U.S. dollar index retreated by 48 ticks. February crude oil expanded 218 per barrel. Comex gold increased 320 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index gained almost 11 points, actually more than 11 points, to finish at 552.40. Joining us now to provide some insight is Elaine Cub. Hey, Elaine. Hello, Paul. How are you doing? I ran out of ways to say the word up this week. Kind of a trend all over the place. We'll start with wheat. You could easily say... Uh, Ukraine, Russia is one story. Are we getting a better sense of the other story domestically and just how much wheat was damaged last week? 
Yeah, I mean, it is unusual in December to be looking at North American weather being a, a market influencer, but I think that is the case uh, after that storm of last week that that went through, you know, the entire middle of the United States. And wheat, it's hard to say exactly how bad this will be ultimately to yield because wheat at this time of year isn't really clear, but it's not great. And I'll say this, even aside from the storm, you look at a drought map and it's a reminder that in Western Nebraska, Western Kansas, certainly in Colorado, there is still extreme drought. So if you have a stressed winter wheat crop like that to begin with, and then you come through with some sand blasting winds, I mean, that's it's not gonna be helpful. It's not gonna be helpful for yields. And then on top of that, you've got all the other Northern hemisphere wheat Black Sea region, Europe, everywhere, where there is going to be probably some temptation to skimp on fertilizer applications when we get into the growing season. So I think worldwide, I mean, there are reasons to feel like wheat yields going into 2022 are not, they're not starting anywhere favorable. Let's put it that way. Well, those don't sound like things that are going to recover in just a matter of days. So if I've got my May wheat contract, the chart up now says $8.17. Is that a low for a while? I think that these prices, grain prices in general, commodity prices in general, are well supported. I mean, I think there's there's a very good chance that if we continue to see damage like this, weather damage or weather concerns through the winter, we could see higher prices. Um, but you know, there's a lot of risk going on, especially the end of the year. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it we need too much money on the idea of things staying stable through the last trading week of the year when there's so much fund rebalancing that's going to need to happen after the big moves that all of these assets have had through 2021. Naomi last week said uh, you're not going to sleep much between Christmas and New Year's. There's going to be a lot of instability. Sounds like you're kind of saying the same thing. Uh, in this corn market, uh, we're dealing with uh, a, a little bit of weather, not really in the United States, but more in other parts of the world. We're also seeing a lack, are you saying a lack of Chinese business with corn right now? Is that impacting yeah. us? I, li I like your point about the weather. You know, if you ever want to convince yourself that we're really in a La Nina, consider that we're going to close out here probably the warmest December on record since like the 1890s. And then we're going to go into a polar vortex in the first parts of January. So we're going to experience that wildness. But remember that the classic symptom of a La Nina pattern in South America is that dry weather. And we're starting to talk drought and drought in, in South America too. And that is a mover for corn. I mean, traditionally we think of it being a mover for soybeans, but it's for corn too. There's full season corn crops that are already being affected by the fact that those forecasts have some showers in them, but they're very light. And the temperatures are, are forecast to be hot in the nineties. So none of this is great. Again, I think we are in a pattern where these, these prices are well supported because for the next six weeks, or so, if the weather scenario doesn't change, there's just all of this likelihood of, of, of seeing bullishness about poor yields worldwide. Is the crude oil story also impacting oil right now when it, and then it translates into ethanol? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, well supported because these crops you can make money on them. You can turn, you can crush this into ethanol on the one hand, but also DDGs. You know, you've got soybean meal at $400 a ton, DDGs, all of these feed prices are another favorable driver to make sure that the basis stays strong. People want the grain, keep the grain moving, bring it in fast. You know, the, the, the futures markets themselves are inverted, suggesting that the commercial part of the industry wants to receive this grain, doesn't want to motivate farmers to just put it in storage and forget about it. They want to see this stuff keep moving. We are recording this show on Wednesday, so we don't know how the Thursday is going to go. But with the soybean market, Elaine, we stuck over $13 on Wednesday, well above it. Is that a sign and a door opening to higher prices? Well, I think prices, we can't get too greedy with these prices, right? There is a limit to how far they could continue rising before you'd start to see pushback from the end users. I mean, you think about uh, the transportation costs. It takes $1.60 to get this stuff across the ocean to Asia, which is, you know, maybe double what it was even a year ago. So adding all of these costs in just makes it harder and harder for the market overall to keep climbing too much higher. Um, but I, yeah, don't look a gift horse in the mouth, especially at Christmas, right? These are, these are fine prices for, for the soybean market. 
a gift of sorts. Uh, what, what's the old saying? The, uh, the the bulls eat turkey at Thanksgiving. They're also eating it at Christmas is, is one story. I want to ask a viewer question, and it kind of relates to the two things you've said already. Uh, let's talk Tim in Iowa here. And he says, should $6.13, meeting the uh, price of corn, the price of soybeans, be the reason to sweep the bins clean? Okay, so I'll repeat myself a little bit because I think these prices are well supported. I don't think we need to panic necessarily and worry about prices falling apart. I mean, other than, you know, short-term volatility here at the end of the year, but going into January, there's all of these weather reasons to continue to feel bullish or at least neutral about grain prices, not to panic. And you don't have to run out and sweep the bins just yet, but I will say not the prices, but the structure. And I mentioned those few, those inverted futures contracts that itself suggests that certainly if you have hedged grain and you would traditionally just just lock a price in for that and, and plan on uh, taking that carry for your stored bushels, that's not going to be a winner of a strategy in 2022. So there are reasons to keep the grain moving, but I, I don't feel like prices are in imminent danger of falling apart in a big way. Over what time period? Well, let's say, yeah, between here and March, let's okay. say, if, if, if nothing changes in the weather in South America. However, you know, if, they, if, if something did change and they did start to see a wet pattern and, and, and more optimism for their yields, then I would be in a very big hurry to sell something. All right, in the South, uh, we've kind of neglected cotton the last couple of weeks. Cotton's kind of been moving sideways, but this week put, did put on a dollar. Uh, we're still trading over 100 but is this a range right now that we're in? Yeah, and I think it helped this week that they had a, a fairly strong export sales report. And that that really does need to be the, the underpinning of this market is exporting, particularly to China, to the Chinese garment industry. To the extent that that global trade continues, I think we can continue to see strength in cotton, but perhaps not to retest that, that really high high from November when all of the commodities were sort of seeing that big boost of interest. All right, let's move to the livestock. And we've kind of touched a little bit about Kansas. There was also 400,000 acres burned last week. Hundreds of cattle killed. Uh, we're not seeing a, an attribution to that on a reason for a rally in the, in the meats. Why are we seeing a rally in live cattle? Well, the futures went up a little bit, but actually the cash trade this week went down a dollar, three dollars, and it, it's kind of stayed unusually sort of the same price as the futures contract there at 135. And that, you know, is a reflection of the holiday itself, of the, the shifts at the packing plants. And so you'll see slightly lighter demand, only like 120,000 head per day butchered here in uh, Tuesday and Wednesday of this week. So that's not too unusual for a holiday time frame. but looking longer term, yeah, these, these markets are well supported too. There's a lot of demand for getting these animals that are profitably butchered into the system. If you did not watch this show on YouTube on Wednesday or Thursday before the Cattle on Feed report, you kind of saw how that came out. But why the market was pointing to that, or at least a lot of analysts were pointing to this report meaning something. Why? Yeah, yeah, I think there will be volatility when the market comes back in on Monday because there was such a wide range of expectations going into this cattle on feed report. So it's not like everybody was expecting to see one number, then that number shows up Thursday afternoon and then you have a weekend to think about it. It's going to surprise somebody. And we did not have a very large volume of futures trade in the cattle this week. So I think folks are just kind of waiting to react to that to report. And when Monday shows up, I, I suspect there'll be kind of a big shift one direction or another. All right, I'm going to make you repeat yourself again because we're going to talk about grain impacting the, the feeder cattle market, uh, just all the feed inputs. You mentioned how high meal has gone, corn has gone high, weeder. There, what do you feed an animal right now in the grains? Yeah, great question, Paul. I guess you just bite the bullet and pay and pay the prices because because there is money down the line, right? As I mentioned, there's demand for for the fed animals. There's demand for the beef, you know, all the way down the supply chain. Uh, this is this is supported. And when you go to the sales barns, there's good demand for calves, particularly the high quality calves that would eventually potentially grade prime. So I guess you just like I said, just just pay the money and, f and feed the, the feed because it has to be done. Um, and and well, you know we talked about the wheat fields not necessarily being 
the savior of, of the feeder cattle market as we go into a spring because everything is so dry out west. We, that continues to be some of the underpinning of the overall cattle market is that drought in the west and the diminishment of the, the size of the herd. That will continue to haunt or I guess support to the cattle market all the way into 2022 and probably 2023. What do you see going on in the hog market right now? Yeah, again, weird prices just because of the holiday shifts, I think, at the packing plants. Um, and so you have some days that the, the the buyers would come in and really push cash hog prices higher and some days lower. So just a lot of volatility. But but they're also we're expecting to see a report from the USDA Hogs and Pigs report on Thursday afternoon. Give everybody all weekend to sit and think about it. It's expected to be a bullish report. So on Monday, I mean, I'm expecting to see prices move higher in reaction, assuming that the report delivers that. But we did have pretty high volumes of futures trade leaning into that. So I suspect it could, you know, swing real wild the other way if, if folks are disappointed. Real quick, we're seeing a little bit of ASF pop back up in China. Is this a big deal? Well, it, it certainly could be. And it's interesting to consider, you know, the structure of how they've tried to rebuild their hog herd in a more, um, you know, industrialized manner where you have larger number of hogs all together in one facility. So I suspect if it comes back around this time, it, it could be worse. Um, okay. You know. But all right. I, gotta, I asked to you say. way too long of a question for <laughs> 20 seconds. Thanks, Elaine. Okay. <laughs> We'll continue that discussion here as uh, we finish up this installment of Market to Market. I'll ask Elaine about hogs and Market Plus and other things, plus your questions. Join us there. Find that on our website of markettomarket.org. And we've been on the Flipboard train for several years. What we do is we pin stories that we are reading as producers of the show and ones that you think might, be find, you might find them interesting, maybe helpful. Search Market to Market reading material on Flipboard. Next week, we look back at the biggest stories of rural America in the year 2021. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics or meteorology or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.